I'd like to welcome you to the fourth session of this series on Rome Republic to Empire. And this week I want to talk about the institution of slavery in the Roman Empire. This cover picture, Gustave Boulanger, a Roman slave market, 19th century again, French. French artists portraying events in the Roman Empire quite often enjoyed a certain emphasis on flesh. You can see that the purpose of this was not merely to enlighten the French public as to the nature of Roman slavery, but also to provide a certain titillation. However, leaving aside any particular agenda that the artist had, this is a reasonably fair portrayal, so far as I can see, of the institution of Roman slavery. And here is one of the most important aspects of Roman slavery, which is a market where the slaves are bought and sold. You can see the slave dealer in the foreground. He is called a mango. That is one of the names for slave dealer. Another name, if you read the Cambridge Latin course, is Venalicius, but Mango seems to have been the most common name for slave dealers. You can see at once that he's a vicious, brutal, unthinking creature, heartless through and through. He's sitting with a dish of figs or some other fruit, and he's stuffing himself with them, completely careless of the despair and the horror around him. You have a collection of human beings brought from all over the Mediterranean world. You've got a naked child. What he will end up doing, I wouldn't like to imagine. You've got that big man in the background. He will probably end up in a chain gang, working 12, 14 hours a day and He's quite young now with big muscles, but after 15 years of unremitting toil, he'll be a broken down wreck, and it will be quite unusual if he lives much past his 35th birthday. You've then got various women. I somehow suspect that they will not end up in chain gangs, but they will end up performing other services for their lucky purchasers. That is the reality of a Roman slave market. It is something beyond our imagining. It is something which we must set aside all of our modern beliefs and assumptions to try to understand, to try to see it as it was. But let me move to the beginning. Let me talk about our modern assumptions. And I start with a quotation from John Locke's second treatise from 1689. To understand political power right and derive it from its original, we must consider what state all men are naturally in, and that is a state of perfect freedom to order their actions and dispose of their possessions and persons as they think fit within the bounds of the law of nature without asking leave or depending upon the will of any other man. Now, you don't need to be a classical liberal of any kind to regard this as the normal state of affairs. We tend to judge political systems by how well they preserve this original natural freedom of human beings. If a political system does pay a very strong regard to what we call fundamental human rights, then we regard that political system and its various institutions as legitimate. If, on the other hand, you have a political system which does not pay any kind of regard to these fundamental human rights, then we tend to regard that political system as illegitimate and we may even take an active interest in the reform or even the overthrow of that political system. There is nothing considered immoral about opposing an established government if it is widely understood to be violating these fundamental human rights. These fundamental human rights may not be perfectly respected, 
Indeed, I can think of no political system that perfectly respects these rights, but we do regard these rights as a basic assumption. But this was not the case in the past. Until about 200 years ago, the existence of slavery was regarded as an established fact. Nobody wanted to be a slave, that was for sure. Nobody has ever volunteered to be a slave. Well, I suppose some people have. It's a big world and there are some strange people about. But most people regard slavery for themselves as thoroughly undesirable. That does not mean, however, that most people have regarded slavery in itself as undesirable or as morally wrong. In the same way, I don't think any of us would like to work as a waiter in a restaurant. We certainly wouldn't like to have a job where we spend all day every day cleaning other people's toilets. But we accept that somebody has to do this. We may feel sorry for them, but we shrug. That is life. Some people do not have the same opportunities, they don't have the same advantages, they may not even have the same abilities as we have, and everybody has to earn a living. And so, although I don't want to clean other people's toilets, I have no objection if other people do. Indeed, it's very desirable that somebody else should clean those toilets, because I don't want to do it. And that is broadly how people regarded slavery in the past. I don't want to be a slave, I'm very glad that I'm not a slave. But somebody has to bring in the crops, and I'm not going to do it, so let it be the slaves. Slavery is a universal institution, or at least it was until just a few centuries ago. There have always been people, there have always been soft-hearted people, humanitarians, who found the details of slavery undesirable, but very few people who have stood up and said, this is a fundamentally immoral state of affairs, and it must be changed. That is an entirely modern consideration. You can look at the historical records of any civilization, and you'll find that in the past, those civilizations had slavery as an established fact. Slavery is evidenced in the earliest records of the Near Eastern civilizations, and the Greeks and the Romans were no different. They did not introduce slavery. They simply took advantage of an institution which had long pre-existed them and which indeed long post-dated their own civilization. Where the Greeks and Romans were different, however, was that they had an unusual commitment to rationalism. They also had at least a cautious talk of universal rights. If you regard yourself as the free citizen of a free community, the existence of chattel slavery, the existence of a system in which other human beings are formally regarded as property, in the same category as agricultural equipment and farm animals, you will feel some need to give a justification for the existence of these institutions. The Babylonians, the Egyptians, and other peoples simply accepted it. It was the system. But the Greeks and Romans, with their rather rationalist turn of mind, and their strong interest in at least their own personal freedom, meant that they did feel an unusual obligation to explain and to justify the existence of the institution of slavery. And one of the most important philosophers to discuss slavery is, of course, Aristotle, the philosopher, as he was called in the Middle Ages. And here is Aristotle's defence of slavery. But is there anyone thus intended by nature to be a slave, and for whom such a condition is expedient and right? Or rather, is not all slavery a violation of nature? There is no difficulty in answering this question on grounds both of reason and of fact, for that some should rule and others be ruled is a thing not only necessary but expedient. From the hour of their birth, some are marked out for subjection, others for rule. 
You can take this as a shocking statement in a philosopher who has been almost universally respected during the past 2,400 years. It's also interesting so far as Aristotle felt obliged to try to give some defence to the existence of the institution. What it implies is that if you need to defend the existence of an institution, there are some people who object to the existence of that institution. Although the amount of philosophical literature that we've inherited from the ancient world has gone through various filters and certain dissenting views have largely disappeared, there are traces in the surviving literature of a philosophical tradition in Greek civilization that was hostile to the existence of slavery. You have Alcidamus of Elia, a 4th century philosopher, contemporary with Aristotle. God has set everyone free. No one is made a slave by nature. So there was a lively debate among the Greeks, so far as we can tell, about the legitimacy of slavery. This debate was always bounded by the fact that nobody had thought of another system in which people could be persuaded to do unpleasant jobs without having a whip held over them. But there was a debate on the legitimacy of slavery, and this is something that you find evidenced in the Roman legal writings. I can draw your attention to Gaius, a very important Roman lawyer of the 2nd century AD. Slavery is the state that is recognised by the law of nations in which someone is subject to the dominion of another person, contrary to nature. The Greeks and the Romans developed the basic assumption that we have that whatever is natural is right. If you want to know whether an institution is legitimate, one of the first things we tend to ask is, would this institution exist in a state of nature? Is it something that would emerge without a coercive government to maintain it? And if the answer is yes, this is a natural institution, let us say marriage, let us say the partial dominion of parents over their children, let us say the existence of personal property or freedom of speech. If you can see that this is something that would exist in a state of nature, then in a certain degree it is regarded as legitimate and there is no further question over it except to ask should this freedom perhaps be limited in a state society, not a state of nature, should it be limited within a society that has a government in some respect for the public good? But even that is regarded as a deviation from the natural state of affairs. And slavery, the Roman lawyers, and therefore most Romans who thought about these matters, was regarded as contrary to nature. As such, it had to be defended, it had to be justified. There was a debate over the treatment of slaves and indeed over the nature of slaves, though again, hardly anyone, with a few exceptions, hardly anyone seemed to have come to the more radical modern view that slavery was a fundamentally unnatural civilization and that we should give serious thought to its abolition. This is a problematic institution in Roman law and in Greek philosophy, but it is an institution which was accepted as universal and as unavoidable in a settled community. It might be something that did not exist in the state of nature, but given that existing human societies are not within the state of nature and that we live, to use a Christian term, we live in a fallen world, we must accept that slavery exists and it will continue to exist. This being said, let's move to the matter of the growth of Roman slavery. I don't want to give any impression that Italy before the arrival of Hannibal was some kind of paradise in which everyone was free and equal. 
It was not. There was slavery deeply embedded in all the structures of ancient society. However, slavery was limited by the fact that most people were not very rich, and if you want to own five or six thousand slaves, you need to be very rich, and if you don't have those rich people, then you will not have mass slavery. The slavery that did exist in Italy before the Second Punic War was rather low scale. A household, a farm, would have two or three slaves. They would work alongside the ordinary members of the family. They would be slaves, they would be pieces of property, they could be taken off to market and sold if required. They could be punished, they could be mistreated. We must not, as I said, regard the world of Italy before Hannibal as any kind of paradise. But when the average number of slaves per household is one or two, indeed, if most households do not actually have slaves, then the extent of the evil, and we do see it as an evil, then the extent of the evil is much reduced. However, with the growth of inequality that followed the Second Punic War, which involves a movement at both ends of the social spectrum, the people at the bottom became progressively poorer and more desperate, and the people at the top became progressively richer, and if you can avoid any moral tone to it, they became somewhat more arrogant, then the extent of slavery altered. It became more widespread and more large-scale, and this brought about considerable changes in the nature of slavery within the Roman world. Most slaves were captured. They were prisoners of war from the newly conquered territories. And this is how slaves have generally been recruited. Slaves born in captivity have always been a minority, and they've always been a minority for a very good reason. If you are a slave, if you are a piece of property, if you're a woman, your master may make sure that you are made regularly pregnant and that your offspring are also slaves, and that that will increase the value of his slave stock. But broadly speaking, slaves are not terribly interested in having children for very good reasons. Why would you willingly bring another human life into the world when it will share your own degraded status? Slaves did not have much opportunity for forming stable unions. There were slave marriages, but mostly speaking, slaves were atomized individuals at the beck and call of their master, and such people do not tend to be interested in procreation. There are further reflections you can base on that fact, but I'll leave those aside for the moment. So we can take it that most slaves were first-generation slaves, and that they had become slaves because of conquest in war. Again, indeed as ever, we do not have anything approaching the kind of statistics that our societies have been heaping up since about 1500. But we have various anecdotal snippets that we can use as indicative of what was happening. When Scipio Aemilianus took Carthage in 146 BC, he enslaved 60,000 Carthaginians, these people made their way to various slave markets throughout the Mediterranean, and they ended up in various kinds of subjection. Marius, someone I'll talk about next week, when he threw off the German invasions of Western Europe and Italy at the end of the second century, enslaved about 140,000 barbarians. Again, these found their way to the slave markets. Aemilius Paulus, in his conquest of Greece in the 2nd century BC, he enslaved about 150,000 Greeks. Pompey and Caesar, the two big men at the end of the Republic, together enslaved more than a million Asiatics and Gauls. These swelled the slave markets. Slave traders would follow Roman armies as they went about, 
they would buy slaves, they would buy prisoners of war from the soldiers, they would arrange for payment in ready cash for the soldiers, and they would also arrange for the slaves to be transported out of the Roman camp and taken off deep within the empire to be to be processed, let's call it. That is, to be taken off to slave markets, to be examined, to be graded, and to be assigned to various categories of slave to be taken up onto the block. So if you were a Greek and you were literate and you were some kind of scholar, you'd be offered as a tutor. If you were a farm labourer, then you would be offered as a field slave. That is the reality of Roman slave markets. Here again, another French painting from the 19th century. And once again, you can see that the artist may have had an agenda that went beyond simply enlightening his viewers as to the nature of slavery. But this, I have no doubt, is an entirely accurate portrayal of certain kinds of slave market. Here's a rich young man, and he's on the lookout for slaves. He's being offered various young ladies whose charms have been displayed to his inspection. You can see the slave dealer. You can't see him very well, but you can find this picture on Wikipedia and you can blow it up. If you look at his face, you'll see that it's hard and heartless. You can see that rather hard beard and the hard look on his face. But then what kind of human being is it who makes a living from the purchase and sale of human flesh? in the knowledge that many of the people you're selling will be treated with shocking inhumanity. It's not a job that I could readily do, and it's not a job that you could do. The kind of people who did that kind of job were notoriously unpleasant. So there is a representation of an ancient slave market. There were slave markets in every large town, every large city throughout the Mediterranean, but there were certain centres which specialised in the processing and sale of slaves. The island of Delos in the middle of the Aegean, for example, that had the capacity to receive and process 10,000 slaves daily. If anyone's ever been to Hayon Wai, which is the centre of the British book trade, it seems to be the centre of the book trade in the English-speaking world, you'll see that almost every shop in that town, converted cinemas even, are bookshops filled with books. If you want to buy certain kinds of books, leave aside that you can buy them on the internet nowadays, but if you're on the lookout for certain books, you'll take yourself to Hay on Wye. And in the same way, in the ancient world, if you're on the lookout for slaves, you may have been on the lookout for slaves for your own use, or as a seller of slaves, you would make your way to Delos because that was one of the principal slave markets of the Mediterranean world. And as it says on the slide, it had the capacity to process 10,000 slaves a day. Slaves could also be sold, rather like second-hand cars, by private individuals. So if you wanted to get rid of a particular slave or you wanted to buy a slave, you would not take yourself to a slave market. There would be a private contract of sale. Roman magistrates had a duty to supervise the slave trade, not necessarily to humanise it, not to prevent the more shocking abuses of slaves. That was a matter for the slave owners to decide. But to make sure that the slave trade was regularised to make sure that it took place in a respectable and lawful manner. And when I say a lawful manner, in a way that ensured that those people buying slaves got proper title to the slave and that the slave was more or less as described. Oh, it was also possible to rent slaves. Indeed, if you were a wealthy person, if you were a politician in the late Republic, you would often hire gladiators. You would hire gladiators from somebody else for your own personal protection as you went about your business, 
or for the purpose of disrupting other people's political meetings. You might also, if you're a farmer and you had an unusually large harvest, not want to buy slaves because this was an unusual event, what you might want to do was to rent slaves for a short period from somebody else, or you might go to somebody who specialised in hiring out slaves for short periods. So there was as regular a market in slaves in the Mediterranean world as there is nowadays in second-hand cars. And slaves were treated by the law in much the same way as second-hand cars. The law functioned simply to make sure that the slaves being sold were as described and that the seller had sufficient title to those slaves. For those of you who are interested in these matters, here is a slide which talks about the valuation of slaves. And some people are shocked when I talk about the valuation of slaves because it is a fundamentally immoral institution so far as we regard these matters. It is surely immoral to talk about the value of slaves, how they were priced. But a slave is an asset and if you learn that a slave was sold for so many gold pieces or so much weight in silver, it is interesting in the abstract sense to understand how those prices were determined. Probably the best way to look at the valuation of slaves is to see slaves as an income-bearing asset. If you're buying a tutor for your son, if you're buying a sex slave to share your bed, these valuation formulae do not work very well. But most slaves were economic assets. They were field slaves. They were mine slaves. They were people to be worked to death over a certain period. And during the period when they were alive, or at least during the period when they were healthy and productive, they would yield an income. And therefore, the purchase price of that slave would reflect the anticipated future value of the income stream from that slave. And so you can value slaves by looking at the expected profit per year from the use of that slave's labor. You can look at the prevailing rate of interest to see how much you would earn by lending the money out at interest as opposed to tying it up in a slave. And then of course you need to look at the productive life expectancy of slaves I've given that formula, I've put some figures through it, and what I've shown, I think, if my calculations are correct, if the anticipated profit from possessing a field slave is £10,000 a year, and if the average life expectancy of that slave after he's been set to work in the fields is 15 years, and if the interest you could get by lending out the purchase price to somebody else is 5%, then the present value of that slave will be £96,202. If interest rates go up, the present value of that slave will fall. If an epidemic comes along, or if there is an endemic sickness among the lower classes which reduces the productive life expectancy of slaves, again, that red figure will go down. And of course, if there is a great flood of slaves onto the market from a successful foreign conquest, that will have a further destabilizing effect on the valuation of slaves, though this will be from the supply side rather than from the demand side. But if you have the existence of slavery, and if slaves are regarded as productive assets, then you do need some way of valuing those slaves. You need to understand how it is that the price of slaves will rise and fall over time, and this kind of formula is an approach to explaining the fluctuating price of slaves during the late Republic and during the early Imperial period. And although these particular formulae are 
of fairly recent construction. These formulae did not exist until a few hundred years ago. Much cruder versions, but although crude, effective, much cruder versions of these formulae do seem to have existed since the earliest period of Mediterranean and Near Eastern history. You can see some reflections of something like these valuation formulae in various Babylonian and Egyptian records. So a slave is an income-bearing asset and as such is subject to exactly the same valuation formulae as a piece of factory machinery or indeed to an annuity. But I'll leave you to look at that for yourselves. What about slave occupations? Remember what I said last week, there was a prejudice against paid labour. Most people, most free people in the Mediterranean world, did not want to work as salaried employees. Therefore, if you ran a workshop making sandals or cheese, you would not employ free labour in those workshops because you would not be able to get free labour. You would instead buy slaves, and the slaves would work, not necessarily under the lash. I'll talk about how slaves were controlled rather later on. But you will find that most businesses in the Mediterranean world used slave labour rather than salaried free labour. And slaves were used in almost every occupation, not just as field slaves or mine slaves, we can understand that, but slaves were used as secretaries, builders, architects, doctors, readers, tutors, hairdressers, almost any occupation you can think of was largely colonised by slaves. I mentioned earlier that with the growth of a very rich class in Rome and Italy, you had an expansion in slave numbers owned by any particular individual. Once again, we don't have anything approaching proper statistics. It is largely a matter of combing the sources for anecdotes and trying to extrapolate from these. But the city prefect in 61 AD, a man called Pedanius Secundus, he kept 400 slaves, which is an unusually large number, as far as we see it. Gaius Caecilius Isidorus, himself a former slave, left 4,116 slaves in his will in 8 BC, and a 2nd century writer, Athenaeus, claims that some very wealthy individuals owned as many as 10 and 20,000 slaves, most of those would not have been working in the house. They would have been field slaves or mine slaves. But 10 or 20,000 slaves is a considerable number of human beings to own. Indeed, if you look at a Roman household, a wealthy Roman household, some slave owners had so many slaves that they needed a nomenclator to identify the slaves. You're a rich man in Rome, you're walking through your house, which is a palace. You go into the kitchens and your nomenclator whispers behind you, oh, that one there, that's Clemens. You bought him last week at the slave market. Oh, hello, Clemens. How are you? I hope that you're enjoying subjection in my household. Any complaints, do see the steward, won't you? But I don't think there are any complaints, so just get about your work. There's a mosaic, a slave boy, Junius. He's doing slave boy things. He's working in the kitchen and he's holding a tray of figs. So those are some of the slave occupations. Indeed, there are very few occupations which were closed to slaves. The treatment of slaves. Let's have a look at these two sources. The one on the right is from Galen, a Greek doctor, but a man who lived in Rome for a long time. And with the imperial period, the definition of Romans becomes rather vague. It includes large numbers of Greeks. Galen was a Roman citizen. He lived and worked in Rome for many years. He counts as a Roman. 
And here is a rather strange extract from one of his works on passions and errors. I'll read it to you. When I was a young man, I imposed upon myself an injunction which I have observed throughout my whole life, namely never to strike any slave of my household with my hand. And you read that far and you think, ah, what a nice man Galen was. He refrained from striking his slaves with his hand. So what we have is a man of great humanity, and he was a great physician, so you don't regard that as at all unusual, but you like to see it spelled out. Uh, but he continues, My father practised the same restraint. Many were the friends he reproved when they had bruised a tendon while striking their slaves in the teeth. He told them that they deserved to have a stroke and die in the fit of passion which had come upon them, they could have waited a little while, he said, and used a rod or whip to inflict as many blows as they wished and to accomplish the act with reflection. I don't think that I would like anything like that to go out under my name, but here you have one of the great medical writers of the ancient world, a man whose medical writings were considered effectively the last word in medical science until the 16th century, casually saying that you shouldn't hit slaves with your hand because you might hurt yourself. Instead, you should set about them with whips and rods. That tells you much about the treatment of slaves. Or on the left, you have a somewhat more lurid story about Vedius Pollio, a very rich and important Roman, he kept a pond with flesh-eating fish in it. Don't ask what kind of flesh-eating fish, because I can't answer that question. This was his way of keeping control over his household slaves. The source continues. Once, when he was entertaining Augustus, his cupbearer broke a crystal goblet, and without regard for his guest, Polly ordered the fellow to be thrown to the fish. Hereupon the slave fell on his knees before Augustus and supplicated him, and Augustus at first tried to persuade Pollio not to commit so monstrous a deed. Then when Pollio paid no heed to him, the emperor said, Bring all the rest of the drinking vessels which are of like sort, or any others of value that you possess, in order that I may use them. And when they were brought, he ordered them to be broken. That's one version of the story. The other version of the story is that the slave was thrown to the fish, eaten to death, and after that Augustus was so shocked that he put the word round that anyone who was seen to be a friend of Pollio would be no friend of the emperor. But what this source tells us, whether or not it's true, and you can't always believe these stories, but whether or not this particular story is true, it tells you about the absolute and unaccountable power that an owner had over his slaves. If you wanted to, and if a slave upset you slightly, you could have him thrown to the fish. You could crucify him. You could burn him to death. You could beat him to death. You could strip him of the fine clothes that he has as a household slave. He could stop being your son's tutor he could be carted off to be chained up with other slaves to work out the rest of his life in the fields. If you owned a slave, you had exactly the same dominion over him as you have over your car. Indeed, the modern laws are probably more restrictive in what you can do to your cars than what you could do to your slaves. Until the Emperor Domitian made a law strictly forbidding it, you could have your male slaves castrated if you so wished. You could do anything you liked to them. We come to another important aspect of how slaves were treated. They were, of course, sex objects. It was the duty of a slave, a duty enforced by law, to obey every single order given by a master. If a master said, bring me a cup of wine, it was a slave's duty to bring a cup of wine. If a master said, take off your clothes and wait over there, it was the duty of a slave to take off his or her clothes and wait over there. Pompey has at least one 
specialised brothel which we've identified, it is entirely likely that the sex workers in that brothel were slaves. There is evidence for freelance prostitutes, free prostitutes, who would make an arrangement with a brothel owner to take over a cubicle and to share the rent, rather as there are minicab drivers nowadays who make a deal with a minicab company. They pay a certain amount of rent to the minicab company, they receive a number and a radio, and they then ply for hire. And in the same way, prostitutes could make that kind of agreement with a brothel owner. But it does seem that... In most instances, prostitutes were slaves. They were property of the brothel owner, and their job was to service such clients as they were directed to service, and the whole profit of the transaction was taken and kept by the brothel owner. Here's a quote from Seneca. Naked she stood on the shore at the pleasure of the purchaser, Every part of her body was examined and felt. Would you hear the result of the sale? The pirate sold, the pimp bought, that he might employ her as a prostitute. It becomes more lurid. Here is Seneca again, oh, before then, another French painting. Again, a slave market. This young lady is not being sold for her ability to cook or to dress hair. I don't need to explain exactly why she's being sold. I don't need to explain the purpose for which she's being sold. And here you see an assembly of old and ugly men who are all bidding furiously for who should have the right to rape her. You can see in the foreground, in the bottom part, a young man urging his father, go on daddy, buy her for me. I promise I'll be good. I'll study hard. I'll pass my exams. Can I have her please? Once again, this is a painting produced not entirely for the enlightenment of the viewers, but it is not an unlikely representation of what happened in an ancient slave market. And now I come to the Seneca quote on the left, which I suppose I shouldn't read, but I will. There was a man named Hostius Quadra, whose obscene acts even became the subject of a theatrical performance. He was rich, greedy, a slave to his millions. The deified Augustus did not consider him worth being avenged when he was murdered by his slaves, and almost proclaimed that he seemed to have been murdered justly. He was vile in relation not to one sex alone, but lusted after men as well as women. He had mirrors made of the type I have described, the ones that describe images far larger, in which a finger exceeded the size and thickness of an arm. These, moreover, he so arranged that when he was offering himself to a man, he might see in a mirror all the movements of his stallion behind him, and then take delight in the false size of his partner's very member, just as though it really were so big. Is this a true story? I see no reason to doubt it. It comes with fairly good provenance. But whether or not it's true, it illustrates the fact that a slave was the absolute and unconditional property of his master, or her master, and that a slave was absolutely obliged to do exactly as ordered, without delay, without complaint, and also, I suppose, to keep it quiet. I'll come to the moral effects of slavery in a moment. I'm still with the general treatment of slavery. Most slaves, as I've said, worked as agricultural labourers, And the Italian soil after the Punic Wars was largely worked by hundreds of thousands of slaves in chain gangs. They worked until they died, then they were replaced. They worked on large estates called latifundia. The average life expectancy of slaves of this kind appears to have been the middle to high 20s. That's what seems to be the evidence we have from looking at the skeletons of undoubted slaves. For those slaves who did not work as directed 
The ultimate punishment was the Ergastulum, an underground prison where they worked and died in darkness. They were made illegal during the reign of Hadrian, deep into the imperial period, but we don't know to what extent that law was obeyed. There was also the charming custom of abandoning slaves when they were too old or sick to work. You have a slave, he's in his mid-fifties, he can't work anymore, he's no longer worth the food that you give him. You can't sell him, nobody wants to buy a worthless slave, so you take him somewhere and just dump him. A bit like, again, a bit like people dump cars once they get past a certain level of dereliction. The island in the Tiber in Rome was a favourite dumping ground for worthless slaves. There were, however, kind people in Rome. This is not a society made up universally of monsters. There were kind people in Rome who would go across the island and feed the abandoned slaves and sometimes nurse them back to health. You then had a legal issue arising. The slave had been abandoned, but to what extent was the slave still a slave? And the law did seem to suggest that just because a master has abandoned a slave does not mean that the slave has ceased to be his master's property. In the reign of Claudius, there was a run of legal cases in which masters would try to reclaim possession of their abandoned slaves after they'd been nursed back to health. The emperor made a quick law which declared that an abandoned slave was, by the fact of being abandoned, freed, which put an end to this practice. What about slaves who ran away? And running away was an option because these were not very closely supervised societies. There were no police. The authorities were rather small in relation to the population. If you were a household slave in Rome and you wanted to run away, you did have many opportunities for doing that. You walked out of the door and you ran for it. You're in a city of half a million, maybe three quarters of a million. You can disappear and never be found again. You change your appearance. You do various things. You become free. Or you can run away from the town and you can go and live somewhere else. You can remake yourself. You can say that you are a Greek hairdresser from Alexandria, something like that. The opportunities for running away were very substantial. Masters knew this, and so quite often they would put special collars around the necks of their slaves. And here is one of the tags from a slave collar, a bit like tagging dogs. But if you were a slave owner, you would sometimes put a collar around the neck of your slave, and here is one. It says, Hold me, lest I flee, and return me to my master Viventius on the estate of Callistus. That's in the British Museum. There are some slave collars from a brothel in North Africa which say rather alarming things like, I am a filthy whore, I have run away from this particular brothel, if you find me, bring me back and you'll receive a reward. There were strict laws against harbouring runaway slaves, and if a slave was caught and returned to his master, remember the slave is a piece of absolute property, and so you as a master can impose whatever punishment on your runaway slave takes your inclination. You can whip your runaway slave, you can burn him with hot irons, you can crucify him, you can burn him to death, do whatever you like to him. Or you could just brand on his forehead the letters F-U-G for fugitivus. And then you might have one of those collars riveted around his neck so that he wouldn't run away again. Or if he did run away, he wouldn't get very far. Oh, slaves in the arena, that's a huge subject. And you'll forgive me if I don't go into details on that. What I will say, though, is that the gladiators who fought to the death in the arena were not always slaves, and it was necessary for the imperial government to make laws to prevent members of the senatorial classes from fighting in the arena. Indeed, I'll go slightly further. If these gladiatorial games were to be brought back in the modern world, 
I have not the slightest doubt that very large numbers of young men would apply to become gladiators and to fight in the arena. The thought of winning $20 million as a prize and the thought of being watched by 500 million people on Netflix would be far too much. You may find that unlikely, but I have no doubt that it's true. In the same way, in the Roman world, many free young men volunteered to fight in the arena, but many of those gladiators were slaves. They were bought from among the prisoners of a successful military campaign. They were trained by Alanista, somebody who owned a gladiator training school, and they would be rented out to entertain the people of Rome in those gladiatorial games. But I'll say no more about that. Oh, there is a picture by Sir Lawrence Alma Tadema, a famous Victorian painter. It supposedly shows life among the leisured, wealthy classes of the empire, and it's rather pleasant. They're out for a walk, they've stopped, and they're having a little rest, and you've got some of the older people sitting there dozing, other people gossiping, others standing up and looking out over a fine prospect. But there in the foreground, you've got one of the slaves. He's holding a sunshade, Look, he's got his owner's name embroidered or painted on his clothes. He doesn't have shoes, he's barefooted, his head's shaven. You can see a look of bored despair on his face. That's his life, it won't change. If it does change, it'll only be worse. And he's waiting patiently for his owner to say, Right, that's it, I think we should be getting back now, it'll be lunchtime soon. That is the reality of a slave's life for much of the time. Let me now talk about the moral effects of slavery. We can focus on how terrible life must have been for many slaves. And I don't need to say too much more about it. You were a piece of property. You were subject to the absolute dominion of your master. Your master might not actually be such a bad person, and probably most slaves were not dreadfully treated, but many were. But let's look at the moral effect on the owners. Let us imagine that you're a boy. Let's focus on boys, because I used to be one. You're a boy. You're the son of a rich man, perhaps the only son of a rich man. You're brought up in one of these great Roman palaces which contained 4,000 slaves. You are surrounded from your earliest days by slaves. The woman from whose breasts you suck milk was a slave woman. The boys with whom you play in the gardens of the palace, they're slaves as well. They're slaves and you're not a slave. And as you grow up, you find that those slaves are not willing to carry out your orders, as and when you give them, but they are quite eager to anticipate your orders. It doesn't matter how stupid your jokes are, the slaves will laugh as if what you said is the last thing in wit. It doesn't matter how ugly and smelly you may be, they will keep insisting that you're a person of surpassing beauty, Many of those slaves, not because they're bad people, but because they simply want to stay alive and to enjoy a decent life, will very carefully study you, and they will try to work out what it is you really want. Do you have any particular unspoken desires? And I can say that many boys, many teenage boys, do have certain desires which they do not care to discuss because they are fantasies which are incapable of being fulfilled. But if you're that young teenager in a Roman palace living among slaves, those slaves will, as I said, they will study you very closely and they will work out what it is you want and you won't have to ask for it, they will offer it to you. And if you enjoy it, they will find other things that you might enjoy, other things of the same nature. What I'm saying is that 
without being a person of great personal immorality, without being a person of a naturally evil disposition, you will be corrupted from your very earliest days because you are living in a company of slaves who are not merely willing to carry out your every stated instruction, but who are eager, indeed desperate, to find out what else you may want that may gain favour in your eyes. So what you will see is a society of the wealthy who are absolutely abandoned in the moral sense. And of course I'm thinking mainly about sexual services, but it could be anything else, anything whatever you want to name. It may be that you're interested in the occult and you think that by carrying out a human sacrifice you can somehow gain yourself an advantage. Well, you could sacrifice a slave, you can kill your slaves if you feel so inclined, and so you'll be encouraged to indulge those fantasies. There is a story of Flamininus, the man who liberated Greece in 196 BC. He was having dinner with a young friend, a young male friend whom he wanted to impress. And this young friend said, you know, I've never seen a man die. And Flamininus said, what, you've never seen someone die? That's astonishing. He snapped his fingers, had a slave brought into the dining room, who was promptly put to death for him. Imagine living in that kind of society, and you have some understanding of the violence and extreme debauchery of Roman politics in the late Republic. Politics are dominated by a group of men who have been brought up in slave households where their every wish has been immediately indulged, and as I keep on saying, where their most silent and private wishes have been ferreted out by the slaves, and those have been indulged as well. If you want to understand the extreme violence and desperation and the grotesque immorality of political life in the later Roman Republic, the first place you need to look is the household arrangements of these wealthy families, where boys and indeed girls were brought up by slaves whose position required them to corrupt those young people, to corrupt them absolutely. And if you want to look beyond the early Republic, if you want to ask, how could it be that the emperors behaved in such a bestial manner to the people of the empire? The answer is that from their earliest lives, if they were people of even moderate debauchery, they had been accustomed to treating their slaves as instruments of their own will and enjoyment, and once they obtained political dominion over the free citizens of the empire, they would carry over everything they had learned from the treatment of their own slaves into the treatment of their subjects. That is the greatest difference between the Roman upper classes and ourselves. There are many things which we simply cannot do. There are many things which have not been possible in Christian civilization. There are many things, indeed, which could not be done in the more grotesque communist tyrannies of the 20th century. Lavrenti Beria, for example, was a paedophile. He was one of Stalin's ministers. He was head of the secret police. And he would indulge his tastes in the most revolting way. But he does not seem to have been average for the Soviet ruling class in the time of Stalin. And as soon as Stalin was dead, Beria was seized by his remaining colleagues, given a show trial and shot fairly promptly. But imagine a society which is made up of people like Lavrenti Beria, and you have the later Roman Republic and the High Roman Empire. What happened when it got too bad for the slaves? Imagine again 
you have chain gangs, you have an estate worked by chain gangs of 10 and 20,000 slaves. The slaves are many, the owners are few. Every so often the slaves will be pushed beyond a certain limit and then they will rise up. And the late Republic saw a number of vast slave revolts, not simply individual acts of revenge where a slave was pushed beyond a certain limit and he murdered his master, though such things did happen, but great uprisings where an entire estate of 10 or 20,000 slaves would break their chains and set about murdering their masters and their supervisors, and where this revolt would then spread to other estates. The first of these great uprisings was in Sicily in 135 to 132 BC. Sicily was one vast slave plantation, growing corn and food of all other kinds for export to Italy. The slaves were treated with the usual shocking inhumanity, and on one occasion, Eunice, a slave from Syria who was subject to religious visions, he inspired 400 other slaves to revolt. He captured the town of Enna, and the success of his revolt spread immediately through all the other great estates in Sicily, and there was a general uprising. It took the arrival of a large Roman army in Sicily to suppress this slave revolt. It was suppressed with horrible atrocities. Eunice was put in prison and he rotted to death from a disease called phthiriasis, which I'm told didn't exist. I have read quite a lot of the medical literature some doctors say it did exist, others say it didn't. Philip II of Spain may have died from it. The Roman dictator Sulla may have died from it. It's a disease which we don't understand, where small insects like fleas grow inside your body and they keep bursting out through your flesh. It sounds a disgusting illness, and I've no doubt it was if indeed it existed, but Eunice died in horrible conditions in prison from this. Then you've got the big slave revolt, 73 BC, Spartacus, shepherd from Thrace, taken as a prisoner of war, enslaved, sent off to Capua to train as a gladiator, escaped with 80 companions, started a revolt, spread like fire throughout Italy, he assembled a vast slave army of 90,000 men. He was a great military leader, and he defeated four Roman armies sent against him. The idea, so far as anyone can tell, is that his strategy was to use this great successful army to break out of Italy so that the slaves could go back to their homes. The Roman armies, however, blocked all the passes. They prevented the escape of this army from Italy. And at last, in 71 BC, the Senate sent out a very large army to deal with Spartacus. Spartacus was outfought and he was defeated. Defeated in Apulia. Spartacus himself was never taken. You may remember the film with Kirk Douglas... Lawrence Olivier, and of course Peter Ustinov, which is not a very accurate account of the Third Servile War, but it does contain substantial elements of the truth. At the end of this slave revolt, 6,000 slaves who weren't returned to their owners were crucified, 30 feet apart up and down the Appian Way that led from Rome to Naples, their bodies were left there to rot, and they could still be seen several years later. They were crucified as a warning to other slaves who might consider the possibility of rebelling against their masters. One of the effects of the Servile Wars, however, was that the Roman government decided that things really couldn't quite continue as they had been. It really was necessary to enforce some kind of minimal standards on the treatment of slaves. These were very minimal standards. But the progress of the early empire saw 
a gradual humanization of the condition of slaves. They never stopped being slaves, and they were still subject to the dominion of their masters, but there were certain customary and sometimes legal limits placed on the treatment of slaves. But one of the main ways of controlling slaves was by the promise of freedom, and this is the positive side to Roman slavery. The Romans could be unspeakably cruel in their treatment of slaves, but the Romans were no exception. Whenever you have a slave society, you have cruelty. It is part of the system. So we can't really single out the Romans for particular moral blame. What is unusual about Roman slavery, though, is the frequency of manumission, or freeing a slave. The Romans were unusually generous by Mediterranean standards in their approach to freeing slaves. You could free a slave in any number of ways. You could take a slave off to a magistrate and make a formal grant of freedom, or you could do it informally. You strike a slave on the face and then say, I free you. You could indeed invite a slave to dinner, and that was taken as legal evidence of manumission. And you were expected to free your slaves for all sorts of reasons. If a slave performed a particularly meritorious service, saved your son from drowning, for example, you were expected, not legally enforceable as an expectation, but you were morally expected to give your slave his freedom. And many masters found that it was a much better way of managing slaves than beating them and crucifying them and threatening the survivors with the same, to offer slaves their freedom. The deal was often something like this. You're my slave. You are going to cut my wife's hair and look after her for seven years. If at the end of that time she's happy, I'll free you. That was an offer held out to household slaves, not to field slaves. They worked until they died, and they were the majority, but to household slaves. There does seem to have been a reasonable expectation of freedom at some point. This was usually enough to keep a slave household in Rome a reasonably harmonious place. Some masters were beasts. They slept behind locked doors with swords under their pillows just in case the slaves broke in and tried to murder them. But most don't seem to have done that. The idea was that you manage your slaves with promises of freedom which you will go through with. Now, one of the big exceptions with Roman slavery was this. If you were a slave from Thrace, let's say, and you were sold to an Athenian. The Athenians were extraordinarily mean about freeing slaves, but if you did get your freedom from a rather soft-hearted master, you resumed your status as a Thracian. If, however, you were owned by a Roman citizen and your master freed you, you immediately took on Roman citizenship. You didn't have all the rights and privileges of a Roman citizen. You couldn't stand for election. There were all sorts of things you couldn't do. But those restrictions did not apply to your children. And what this meant was that over several centuries, certainly by about the 3rd century AD, most of the Roman ruling class, most of the higher classes in the empire, were actually descended from freed slaves, and there were several emperors who were the grandsons of freed slaves. It was possible for a freed slave to make himself very rich. And so this is the positive side, if you can talk about a positive side to such an institution, of Roman slavery, that the Romans were unusually generous in granting freedom to their slaves, their freed slaves became Roman citizens automatically, and if certain restrictions applied to freed slaves, these restrictions did not apply to the children of freed slaves. And I do believe, I haven't read the literature that would support this, but I do remember reading some time ago 
that in the excavations of the graveyards outside Pompeii, about 40% of the people who were able to afford a gravestone outside that city had names suggesting that they were freed slaves. That tells you something about the extent of manumission. There are some pictures of gravestones of freed slaves who had done very well. This is quite a nice gravestone. It's a gravestone put up to a wife who'd started out as her master's slave. He'd then fallen in love with her, freed her and married her. And he writes that he's rather sad that she had died first because he'd always expected that he'd be the first one to go. So it's not a completely black story. But as I said at the beginning of today, or as I said in the middle of today, if you want to understand the brutality and the great immorality of Roman politics in the late Republic, you need to take the existence of slavery into account as at least a partial explanation. You may think of British or American politics as a rather dirty game, but it doesn't compare with Roman politics in the late Republic. And I think one of the reasons for that is that in Britain and America, we do not have slavery, and in the Roman world, they did have slavery. So that is... Oh dear, I seem to take you past the time again, but that is what I have to say about slavery. Was that all right?